Greetings, I'm Dr. Gayathri Acharya, Cardiology Fellow at Mayo Clinic. Today we will be discussing the evaluation of patients with sudden death. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Michael Ackerman and Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who both specialize in this area. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you. I'd like to start by asking, th there have been some recent studies uh, evaluating sudden death. Can you summarize those studies for us? Well, we're, we'd like to talk about a series of studies that examined the causes of sudden cardiac death. And a number that gets thrown around a lot is 300,000 people die per year in the United States of sudden cardiac death. But what exactly is sudden cardiac death? So what a series of researchers in uh, San Francisco did was perform systematic evaluation of every out-of-hospital sudden death over about an 18-month period, and that included autopsies in, uh, in over 80% of cases, and then a review of the medical records and adjudication with a panel, a multidisciplinary panel that, that included neurologists, cardiologists, electrophysiologists, pathologists, to try to find out exactly why these people were dying. And although we consider sudden cardiac death, death within uh, 24 hours of last being seen healthy, or within an, hour, within an hour of symptom onset, and assume that these are cardiac, what they found was that about 40% of the deaths were actually non-cardiac, and some were neurologic, about 5%. So it allows us to sort of rechallenge the idea that all of these sudden uh, um, deaths are actually of cardiac origin. Dr. Ackerman, does that surprise you at all, those results? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think what the real challenge with this is the rigor to which we're doing the detective work after somebody dies suddenly. And mm -hmm. the false notion, like Dr. Noseworthy said, that when you do f meet that definition, one hour, 24 hours, that, oh, it must be the heart. And I think we get tunnel vision and we prematurely and erroneously conclude or declare that, oh, it must be the heart at fault, or it must be the heart because of coronary artery disease, mm -hmm. and we continue to invoke the same reflex reactions rather than um, looking at it freshly and say, do we really understand what is killing people, whether they're 65 or 15? And I'm not surprised that there's a significant number of non-cardiac organs involved in the death of a person, whether we're talking about SUDEP or sudden unexplained death and epilepsy that has gone underappreciated. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these deaths are due to uh, drug use and with the opiate epidemic, um, just because you die within 24 hours from being previously presumed healthy doesn't mean it's the heart. I think what is surprising to me is they did that many autopsies to have a, that's one of the highest number right. of systematic autopsies performed. And when we've made conclusions in the past based upon an autopsy rate of 10 to 20%, it's mm -hmm. not surprising that we haven't understood right. the situation fully. So that was quite impressive uh, that these investigators were able to systematically get almost every out of hospital uh, arrest individual autopsy. Mm -hmm. How much of sudden death is preventable? Well, we tend to think of sudden death as a disease of the defibrillator, for instance. And in every paper you read about ICDs, the first line is there are 300 or 300,000, 350,000 deaths per year. The idea being that if we could only get the devices in the right people and address their coronary disease. But this underscores that there are many ways to die suddenly. And uh, we have to reevaluate that periodically. And I think some of our old estimates are probably out of date with uh, changing epidemiologic patterns in the, in, the, uh, in the country. Things like the opiate epidemic, things like increasing use of uh, anticoagulants and antiplatelets, and often in combination, which probably predisposed intracranial bleeds. Um, and uh, some of the other uh, previously relatively underreported or underdetected causes. Um, not all of those things are uh, preventable, but as somebody interested in public health, that's our goal. And I think until we understand the problem, we don't really know how to address it. And then you have the whole issue of what's the phenotype of the sudden death victim? Because some phenotypes are clearly preventable, others are not. And so if you think of sudden death in the young, which should we just define as anybody our age or younger? Sure. Yeah. So <laughs> young people who die suddenly we and others have shown that potentially half of those sudden death victims have a preventable sudden death with 
half of them being due to either legitimate pre-sudden death warning signs that went unrecognized or unreact or weren't reacted to or weren't given the respect that that exertional faint happened during the 100 meter track event, um, the unexplained car accident, uh, where the thought of the possibility of a genetic heart disease lurking behind the scenes being responsible for that car accident. So, and so we think that legitimately half of sudden deaths in young people are preventable if we recognize warning signs, reacted to them, evaluated them carefully. And probably the other half, the only way that we'll ever have a chance to prevent that half of youthful sudden deaths is some sort of screening program to try to identify those who have a sudden death predisposing heart disease. But now when we see with a study like this, that may not be the only reason. Right. So um, thinking about other organs besides the heart that can kill you suddenly as well is what's going to have to be uh, pursued as well. And what are the implications with that in mind for going forward in our clinical practice or, or how this will drive further research? I think we need to be better detectives. Uh, I, I think we do not do as good of a job when there's been a sudden death of a person, we'll say young or not young, to ask questions about the circumstances of the death. I think we move too quickly past that and say, well, this, that's you know, too bad, so sad, as opposed to trying to make sure, is that death the signal of a potentially genetic condition lurking in the family? Right. Um, um, or a non-genetic condition that nevertheless uh, is potentially modifiable and addressable. So I, I just think we, we have to be better to me, in our sudden death clinic here at Mayo, we think of ourselves as detectives. And I think when you put on a detective mindset, it's a very different assessment of the evidence than what you sometimes do in, I would say, ordinary clinical practice. And what the flip think? side of that is also true that I think it's valuable to make the diagnosis of a potentially heritable uh, illness that affects the family, but it's equally valuable to understand that some of these deaths are not due to heritable exactly. causes. Mm -hmm. So we essentially stigmatize a family or at least give them a sense of uh, dis-ease if, uh, if they think that there's something in their family that poses an ongoing threat. So a rigorous evaluation at the time of an unexpected death I think is valuable regardless of the outcome of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the evaluation. Yeah, I mean it's really powerful for these families to give them closure and I think to give them closure as to what was the cause mm -hmm. and to give them clarity as to whether that cause has any relevance to the family members left behind is really important. And, and when we prematurely or erroneously declare that it was due to a genetic heart disease X, Y, or Z, and then they immediately think who's next in line to be knocked right. off, when in fact it had nothing to do with genetics. It's really important that we get it right, and I think there's been a tremendous amount of sloppiness in the literature and in the field. I think the way we uh, evaluate sudden death, uh, the decedent, and the way we evaluate the surviving first-degree relatives is all over the map. Mm -hmm. You know, it ranges from condolences only, and if that, to doing every possible cardiac test, cardiac test on every living family member um, and doing it yearly because after all these things evolve. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a tremendous amount of heterogeneity that goes into the post-mortem evaluation of the decedent um, as well as the post-mortem evaluation of the living family members left behind and a tremendous gap and gradient in how it's done. From the conventional autopsy, right. which is hardly ever done, 85% mm -hmm. uh, or whatever was done in this study was like incredibly impressive, to some places now doing what we call the whole exome molecular autopsy, where if the death is unexplained after a conventional autopsy, we go on and do post-mortem genetic testing, which has opened up a whole new can of worms of who is vetting out the genetic test results and uh, too many to count cases now of ascribing that death as due to mutation X when that mutation had nothing to do with that death and yet you set in motion a chain reaction mm -hmm. that can have disastrous consequences for the family like you said when you make this erroneous presumption right. and conclusion that it's due to the genes when it has nothing to do with 
the gene. Right. So getting it right, whatever the truth is, is what we need to be doing a better job of. Does that further testing gear primarily towards cardiovascular molecular issues, or is it more broad in the context of this article? This article didn't address that um, molecular autopsy specifically, and I think that's sort of an evolving practice and how to deploy that most effectively um, is yet to be determined. I think we're furthest along in identifying potentially heritable cardiac causes of sudden death, um, but this is, I think it's still early days for the molecular autopsy. And I think molecular autopsy is going to have the highest yield in phenotypically suspicious death. Right. Where the chain reaction that's been assessed, you really say that just feels like a heritable channelopathy, or maybe we should have the medical examiner take a second look at the heart muscle because this feels like it certainly could be a cardiomyopathy. And the younger you are when you die suddenly and unexpectedly, the higher the likelihood of a genetic culprit uh, behind the scenes. And so to suggest doing postmortem genetic testing in the 70-year-old who dies suddenly would be a tremendous waste of, of resources. I think um, doing a careful assessment of any death victim uh, to, to avoid prematurely concluding that it's the heart just because he or she was 70 right. and he or she died within 24 hours of seemingly being healthy is also narrow-minded. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this article uh, draws attention to. I want to say thank you to Dr. Ackerman and Dr. Noseworthy for these very important insights today. And thank you for joining us on theheart.org on Medscape Cardiology.